Hi, my name is Haseeb Badhani. I am the founder and CEO of Rafi Systems, a company in the Kubernetes management space. Cool. Uh, first off, what are Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is an orchestration system for containerized applications. Um, many enterprises are modernizing their traditional applications or when they write new applications, they want to write them uh, mm -hmm. such that they can deliver new capabilities to the market faster and faster and faster. Uh, and one way to do that is to essentially break up big fat applications, monoliths into microservices uh, where, yeah. for example, the user interface is one service and the backend is one yeah. service and the database yeah. layer is another service so that you can change these different services independently. So for mm -hmm. example, you can roll out new features in the UI. You don't have to change everything else at the same time, which means you can yeah. now move a lot faster. So break the problem into, into many. The, the way to, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the, I'm just uh, saying that uh, I, I kind of, understand what they are. So it was like released by Google in 2014. What was this, the solution before uh, Kubernetes? What was the, the landscape before that? So containers have existed longer than Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, before Kubernetes, different companies were um, trying to market their own container orchestration platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Hat had one. OpenShift, okay. uh, Rancher had one, um, you know, uh, Mesosphere, another company, they had their own. Uh, so multiple options existed. Google had okay. their own internally called Borg. Uh, and then the community came together and, uh, you know, came up with Kubernetes, which was of course born out of uh, Borg as, as the story goes. Okay. Um, and the open source kind of collective community version of container orchestration, Kubernetes, Mm -hmm. seems to have won the market and all of the proprietary or even different open source ones from other companies mm -hmm. seem to have kind of gone away now. Kubernetes is the winner. Okay. Why did you decide to found this, this business? Why didn't you go in, in another field? Did you just study the landscape? Did you experience the pain of, um, you know, like not having everything, well, having everything centralized and things not loading fast, for example? Why did you decide to start uh, Rafay? Yeah, I think the the um, you know the impetus of starting the company had to do with general purpose uh, infrastructure pains mm -hmm. that companies deal with when it comes to deploying applications in more than one location or more than one cluster. So mm -hmm. uh, when we started Rafay, Kubernetes existed. It was very early, uh, but it existed. And, uh, you know, Kubernetes is a means to an end, it's an orchestration engine, but it was mm -hmm. clear to us that solving for the orchestration layer, yeah, it's an important problem, but that's not the problem in itself. The problem is going to be once the platform, the Kubernetes solution is in place, um, every enterprise or every, anybody who's building applications and running them in production, they're gonna have a set of operational problems okay. that they will have to solve internally somehow. And we thought we should focus on that problem because we had experienced those problems in our prior lives, mm -hmm. uh, in a completely different context. But uh, uh, you know, in, in our previous lives, many of us here at Rafi used to work on a security product, okay. uh, which was a SaaS offering. And you know, we saw some of these pains there: how mm -hmm. hard it is to run things, how hard it is to kind of upgrade, how hard it is to maintain a you know secure environment, how hard it is mm -hmm. to have any level of governance in, in an application environment running in multiple locations. So, uh, so that's where we start thinking, wow, so if somebody should really think about this platform layer. And at the time, Kubernetes was already, it was clear that Kubernetes was going to win. Mm -hmm. So we made a bet on Kubernetes as the underlying orchestration. engine. Got it. Um, you guys got some funding in 2019. Um, shows me here that you have some annual revenue of north of 5 million. What's the pricing of the platform? Like if I would want to use Rafa, I guess you guys have many uh, pricing uh, plans. Uh, how much would I pay? How, how much does it start at? So the way we think about pricing um, is also, you know, kind of really based on how we've seen others uh, charge and what feedback we receive from customers. So the, the traditional model of pricing in this market was or is uh, charged by 
the number of nodes, like the virtual machine or the physical machine uh, on, in, in a cluster or okay. across clusters or mm -hmm. charged by the number of virtual CPUs under management. Okay. And uh, for most enterprises, both models don't work okay. because you know their application scale, they go up and down. Uh, you know, no, node counts change. If you're in the cloud, particularly, the node count is going to change every mm -hmm. now and then. The vCPU count is going to change. Yeah. But, but for the most part, the cluster count is predictable. It's not static, but it's predictable. I know how many clusters yeah. I have. I know that I'm going to add two more next month and on and on. So we, 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 we heard that feedback loud and clear from the market, and we decided to go with an, an, uh, an uh, cluster-based model. So we charge for every cluster under management. Okay. Um, the the platform by default is a SaaS product, so you, you subscribe to the platform, and mm -hmm. then it you know you can use it to provision clusters and then do the management on top of it. And uh, as you add more clusters into the uh, you know uh, the, into your environment and they're being managed with Rafe uh, mm -hmm. incrementally, you pay more money. What's your opinion on per use pricing model vs say a monthly? pricing models because there's various opinions on both of these models. Why did you prefer the, the per use model? Because my experience sometimes when I use the per use uh, pricing plans, I feel like I'm winning less, you know? And I want to juice out like really the, the, the core product. I, I want to juice it out to its very last drop. So if I pay mm -hmm. like 99 a month, well, I will use the, the hell out of this software. For example, what do you think about that? Hmm. So, so I think, I think it's sort of you have to take into account this the kind of product and what it does for the customer. Okay. So, if you think about it, if you're running applications in a Kubernetes cluster or n number of Kubernetes clusters, you're not going to turn them off, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what, what what are you going to do? Right, turn it off and what? Right, your apps yeah. down. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. so, right. right. So in the infrastructure world, I'm not really sure there's a distinction between the two that you described. Like our customers, they they buy in clusters and they keep going and they only go up, right? Because the mm -hmm. more automation is available to an enterprise, mm -hmm. the easier it is for new application teams to show up and consume Kubernetes. So if we yeah. help our customers think about the right platform, right automation through our product, of course. That means the number of clusters Rafe has under management is only going to grow. So mm -hmm. I have not been in a single situation so far, Charles, where somebody says, well, I use it for 27 days. It just doesn't mm -hmm. happen. It's infrastructure. It's critical infrastructure. Um, you know, it runs all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, in situations like in developer environments where, so we provide a capability, for example, in the product where if it's a development cluster and let's say you work 10 hours a day or something, you know, mm -hmm. eight to 10 hours a day, you can press a button and you can drain all your all your uh, nodes, mm -hmm. uh, of the, the worker nodes, not the control plane, so that you can save mm -hmm. money overnight, for example. Right? Okay. Even in those cases, Rafi is still attached to your cluster. The cluster didn't go away. You're not you're just not spending money on, for example, EC2 and Amazon. Nobody's uh, nobody's destroying the cluster as it were. But I think when it comes to infrastructure uh, uh, software, I'm not sure this is a this is an issue. It sort of okay. ends up being the same thing. Yeah, I understand. Okay, uh, talking about your customers, who do you go after um, most of the time? Do you go after, say, funded SaaS, the size of the business in terms of employee and annual revenue? Do you have more info on that? Mm -hmm. So we call on mid-size enterprises uh, to large enterprises. Okay. Uh, look, where we uh, uh, are able to easily express value is when enterprises are you know, on-prem or in the cloud, doesn't really matter, even if it's multiple clouds, mm -hmm. there are a number of requirements that an enterprise will have. And they also apply to smaller companies, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the pain is dire you know, in mid-sized mm -hmm. enterprises or larger enterprises where you have multiple teams, each team will have different applications, you have multiple environments, you know, governance is a question, you know, auditing is a problem that they have to think about. You know, they have to really, you know, uh, enterprises have existed long before uh, Kubernetes or, or containers. They have a set of internal requirements around how they, in, how they manage environments. They already yeah. have a methodology for logging. They already have a methodology for learning. They already have a math methodology for RBAC. And then bringing all that into this new world of Kubernetes, that integration, 
we sell as a product, right? That's, these are capabilities in a product. They're built in, even things like high availability, they're built into the product. So the breadth of the platform is exercised um, more fully by mid-sized enterprises and larger. So we're looking for companies with you know, a few thousand employees, usually um, you know, high hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, and up. Uh, and that's where we're finding a lot of success. Got it. Do you go after specific verticals? So yes, uh, I mean, the platform seems to be pretty broad. I mean, if you look at the logos on our website, you're going to find high tech companies, you're going to find a telco or two, you're going to find financial services companies, you're going to find a healthcare, at least one healthcare company on the, on the website that public. Uh, I'm only talking about the companies that, whose logos are, are public. Um, so it's pretty broad, but certainly I think on the FinServ side, we're seeing uh, a lot of pull. I think a lot of financial services companies are modernizing their stacks and they yep. in particular have to really think about the governance model, right? Are you really sure this platform is operationally ready for you? Bringing up a cluster and deploying an app, that's not a big deal, right? That you can do any time. But, mm -hmm. but as an enterprise, do you, have you really thought about all the controls that should be in place for you to do this at scale, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we, you know, we help and the platform really shines. So FinServer has been a, has been, has been a big success for us. Healthcare mm -hmm. seems to be a, a strong uh, play for us also. So those are mm -hmm. two places where we have our sales teams kind of just kind of focus and calling. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, we seem to be getting inbound from a, from a whole different uh, slew of uh, verticals, obviously, you know, when people reach out, we'll take, uh, we'll, we'll in interact and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll deliver value to them also. But those are the two places, FinServe and healthcare, where we are seeing a lot of traction. Got it, got it, got it. Um, you have a, a small sales team, so I think it's two or three individual and you seem to be recruiting a, a sales director right now. Uh, first question, do you have some kind of marketing program? Do you have some marketing person internally that is in charge of inbound or do you only do outbound? Can you give me a bit more info yeah. on that? So both, uh, so we have people calling, we have partners pulling in deals, uh, we have, uh, five people going up on the sales side. Um, mm -hmm. I, but the inbound piece is really interesting. So uh, we, uh, the, the, on the marketing side, we've done a lot of work around uh, thinking about the right content that helps people, you know, uh, understand and appreciate the problem they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the content marketing strategy that, that our team has put together seems to be really sound. Okay. So if you just kind of, you know, uh, go to our website and look at our documentation site, for example, right? It, it's got, of course, it talks about the Ravi product, mm -hmm. but in general, it, it provides a whole lot of, uh, uh, kind of, you know, recipes and, and solutions yeah. for general purpose Kubernetes, right? How do you solve mm -hmm. various problems in Kubernetes? And we find that people are clearly engaging. I mean, the, the hit rate on the documentation side, particularly the recipe page mm -hmm. is very, very high. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think that's been helping a lot. I think at least when people search for specific problems, you know, they find the site that talks about that one problem and then they kind of go look at the vendor and it happens to be around it. Mm -hmm. So that path has been very productive for the company. Um, we've also made a pretty significant bet in terms of content marketing on Amazon's Kubernetes. So, you know, majority of customers uh, that we talk to at least, right, this is not a, this, the following is not a, a statement about the, you know, markets and how, who, which vendor is more important. It's, it's a function of what we see. We see more Amazon customers than anything else, uh, okay. which means we see more Amazon Kubernetes, which it's called EKS customers than anything else. Mm -hmm. So we've spent a lot of time educating the market on how Rafe, is the right partner if you choose Amazon's Kubernetes. And it turns out to be true. Rafa is hands down the best product in the market. If you're gonna be using Amazon's Kubernetes, we have the best solution for you in the market, hands down. So we've spent a lot of time talking about that, writing about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have done enough uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, what is it called? Like uh, webinars with uh, yep. Amazon talking about that also. So that's been a pretty good source of inbound. So I think, look, I mean, a healthy strategy is always the answer is both. Um, outbound, of course, right? You always have to make calls, et cetera. That's the job. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, inbound, so long as you focus on content marketing, because I think the, the consumers in this market, I don't mean the buyers, but the consumers in this market, they're very sophisticated engineers, right? Usually mm -hmm. they're, they, they understand what they're looking at. So they want to first start with their own analysis and we have to help them with their analysis by giving them a lot of information. And then when they're comfortable, they'll reach out. And that seems to be happening. Interesting. So is it handled by an agency, the marketing side of things, or is it internally? We have, uh, so we, we, we do have a small team in house. 
and okay. they work with a bunch of different partners. So they they work with the you know with the with the PR partner, they work with the SEO partner, they work mm. with uh, you know so they have like three or four different kind of partners outside of the company that they work with, um, and so that we can scale our business. Got it. Where did the name Rafi came from? So Rafi is my son's name. Um, <laughs> it's very simple. Uh, that's it. where it came from. Okay. Um, talking about your your sales team, what kind of outbound efforts do they do? Do they only make calls? Do they do LinkedIn outreach? Uh, do they uh, do email outreach, for example? How do they get their, their leads? All of the above. So, um, you know, definitely they're running sequences. So email outreach, uh, they're calling. Um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, as, as slowly, steadily, some shows are starting. So they're attending certain events out there to engage mm -hmm. with people. And it's not just they, you know, I do the same, right? I'm, you know, I consider myself part of the sales team. Mm -hmm. I make calls, I send emails, um, you know, this is how it's done, right? I mean, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about how like calling is dead or emailing is dead. Yeah. Not really. I mean, it actually works. It's just a function of it. You know, every few years, the, the, the engagement model changes. So yeah. you just have to understand the new model, how people want to consume information and, and behave mm -hmm. accordingly. Uh, mm -hmm. But look, calling works, emails yeah. work, LinkedIn works. We do it. It's, uh, it's producing results. When done the right way. Um, so I do outsource SDR with uh, top leads you might know. Um, you know, I often tell my, my clients that when we do it in a sequence, so first you send an email, then day two, you make a call, day three, you outreach on LinkedIn and you link all of the above together. It is really powerful. So yeah, indeed, nothing is dead. Actually, it's pretty much impossible for something to be uh, dead. We still have iPhones. Um, we still have mobile numbers, you know, so yeah, indeed. Um, I want to shift gears here and ask you, like I, I've seen your, your team, it's mostly engineers. I guess that's your background too. Um, I'm not man managing engineers. I, I have managed um, technical people as per se, and it is in my plan to have my own SaaS in a um, couple of months from now. How is it to manage an engineer? How is it different to manage a salesperson from an engineer? Because my team is mostly salespeople. So I do have huge experience in managing uh, these type of personalities, but how do you manage your team and how do you keep them efficient engineering wise? So, I, I mean, this, it applies to how do you manage marketing uh, teams, right? It's all, uh, I think we just need to kind of think about uh, the, the frequency of touch points is how I mm -hmm. think about it. Okay. I think different uh, job functions they require different frequencies of touch points mm -hmm. and require different uh, kind of you know reporting right from from that side mm -hmm. right what, what have we done like with, mm -hmm. with sales reps um, you know getting into you know weekly daily cadences about okay so the the goal for the day is uh, making it up by the way but the, let's say the goal for the day is you're gonna spend two hours making calls you're gonna spend mm -hmm. a couple hours on sequences and then the rest of the time you're going to be on, on customer calls or some mm -hmm. prospect and prospect call, uh, uh, meetings, right? Because then, mm -hmm. that's how you should kind of plan your day. And then mm -hmm. you're going to check, keep checking, right? Did, you, did this happen? Did this happen? Did this happen? So do it daily, weekly, whatever, but you do it. With engineers, um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the right set of uh, team members, they behave a little bit differently. You know, they, they, they want a lot of information, right? So here's a customer who's, who asked for X. Here's the reason why they're asking for it. Um, please design it and then implement it and let us know how, when it can be done, right? And the right teams, right? They, they take these challenges and they kind of get it done. Right? So you don't need to check in, at least me as a CEO, I don't need to check in on these things. You know, we have you know, a very strong engineering leadership team that takes care of these things. So I think it's, it's just a function of understanding how often to check in. And once you kind of figure that out, it just kind of works, works out just fine. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, salespeople, uh, they have to, their job is very hard. But it's, uh, so you have to understand where it's hard and help them and coach them. And, uh, and also, you know, uh, similarly engineering, their job is definitely not easy, but it's a different set of challenges. As long as you understand the, what the challenge is, and at least for me personally, um, I never want to be in a situation where somebody says, you know what, this guy doesn't understand how hard my job is. No, I do because, you know, I, I've done it. 
right? So better sales or, you know, writing content or, you know, writing code for that matter, right? I mean, you know, having a little bit of appreciation for how hard their job is actually makes it easier. You, you're, you become an empathic uh, leader. Yeah. Um, so, you know, look, I mean, in, in this company, right, I mean, I've closed enough deals here myself and uh, mm-hmm. uh, haven't written, written any code in this company, but, you know, I mean, having done that in the past, at least have appreciation for, uh, you know, what it takes to, to build great solutions, scalable solutions. But I think these are the, this is what it takes. I think people, for example, with, uh, with no appreciation for uh, engineering work, like development, mm-hmm. speaking to uh, uh, kind of timelines, of, uh, development timelines. Mm-hmm. It's, not credible, right? So you want that credibility. And the only way to get that credibility is to is to kind of show it, having done it. I think uh, every time you have people uh, join a team reporting to you, they earn credibility, but you also have to earn credibility. Just because you have a title doesn't mean you get credibility for free. It doesn't work that way. At least I don't believe it. You have to earn credibility every single time with every single person in your company that you interact with on a regular basis. They need to kind of feel like, okay, this person, I can work with this guy, right? I think I this person understands my my pain. This person uh, is going to be there to help me because they understand my life. You know, mm-hmm. that is really, really important. And without that level of empathy, you know, enough, enough kind of, you know, non-engineering CEOs will say things like, well, why is it taking so long? It's a hard problem, man. Relax. Or, or yeah, yeah. you know, engineering uh, leaders will say to salespeople, why haven't you closed anything this, this month? Yeah. Yeah. Here's, you know, you don't understand, right? Both sides are important. And this, by the way, same thing applies to marketing. Why aren't you generating mm-hmm. more leads? Well, it's a process. It takes time, right? Here's what we're doing. Here's, here's, here's how we measure success. If you mm-hmm. don't know what the process, how can you measure success? Okay. Right. And that, that is key. That's a good one. Um, is it a myth to think that engineers and programmers are introverted and do not over communicate that they don't communicate that much? I, I don't know. I think, I think that's a, I, I'm, it's quite possible that folks who are introverts happen to kind of be able to sit back and think more and they sort of become analytical, which is why maybe they go into engineering. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. But on our team, for example, uh, we have enough engineering leaders uh, who I very regularly, uh, you know, invite to customer meetings and they do, they do a fine job. So I'm not sure. I think I think these are things that you know. Uh, I remember you know not too long ago, you know, 12, 14 years ago, my first time ever as a as a marketing pr- or product manager, uh, you know, speaking to a um, uh, like a body of ten people, and my hands were shaking. Yeah, that doesn't happen anymore. So, but at that time it was. It's okay, right? I mean, yeah. you kind of work through it. You 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 mm-hmm. get comfortable, and um, you know, just everything is a fun- is a function of uh, experience and practice. You do it long yeah. enough, it works out. It works out. So I think yeah. the blanket statement doesn't make sense. I think they maybe have never been given that opportunity. And sometimes, when given the opportunity and the uh, and the and the time to learn and get better at it, engineers do just fine. Definitely, are some some of our the best technical spokespeople we have in the company that we take to customer meetings are our engineers. Mm. Got it. Um, I well. I, I view management as a, a way better skill than coding. I personally, I, I do know how to code, but uh, when I will launch my SaaS for sure, like I, I don't really see myself in the trenches and coding. Like this is kind of headaches for me, not because I'm not good at it, but just because I think I can have a, a better impact elsewhere. Do you really think I would need, for example, to to go in the trenches or at I, I think your point is not necessarily going the trenches, but to know what I'm talking about and to have realistic expectation for these guys. If we check, for example, uh, Travis uh, Kalkanik, he didn't code a piece of Uber, but I think he knew like what he was talking about. And on another <laughs> more negative level, if you take like WeWork, for example, Adam Newman probably didn't know a thing about coding and he didn't really know how to coach his team. So is my point valid here? I think so. I think, I think it just, it, it brings us back to the, the point of kind of empathy and appreciation, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, uh, and it also is a function of trust, right? So like, for example, I'll give you an example from this morning. So if you have a prospect who asks for a specific thing that seems like a small thing to me at least, um, mm-hmm. and uh, they said, hey, so you don't do this. Can you, can you add this to the product? 
Mm. And there was a quick Slack conversation and the engineer said, yeah, actually it's, it's pretty easy, but then, you know, we can do it in, in, in N number of weeks because of this other stuff. Mm. And uh, okay, I get it, right? It's fine, right? So, so the, the theory that it's easy is, is sound, but at the same time, all this other stuff's going on, so we're gonna schedule it, it's gonna happen at a certain time. So, you know, we as salespeople have to trust that our engineers are, are gonna do the, their best and they're gonna move at the pace that they can. They move at very, very mm. fast. Um, but at the same time, the engineers are also providing us a lot of good, good data. Like, yep, it's easy. It can be done in two days, but those two days we don't have available right now. The earliest we can get that person to do this is then. And by this mm. date, we'll have it available to you. Go communicate with the customer. Got it. Right? So, so just understanding that, that, right. So I've seen this before in, 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 in other situations where salespeople say, but this is so easy. Do it today. But well, I got other things going on, right? There's not how engineering, they don't just sit there doing nothing. Right? There's, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's, they, they, they also have a whole lot of uh, uh, other work to do, and I think that all kind of brings it back to just appreciation and understanding their job and empathy. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, everybody's busy. Everybody's on the same job. Everybody in this company, any company, is trying to make mm-hmm. the company successful. That's really Don't good. think you're working hard on them. They're all. Everybody's working hard. Yeah, especially when you recruit the right talent, you kind of just need to trust them and get out of their way. So. Really good advice there. Um, I need to leave. I think my neighbor uh, lost her cat or something. So, and I have like a bunch of meetings. I don't have time for that, but I need to to go help her. I think. Um, so, thank you for your time, Hasib. Has been quite enlightening this conversation. Um, and I'll keep you posted for the rest. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.